bazaitzue, hasiko gea, oain eh, elarazi dizkizu egun, bueno, paperetan, jaso ditugun eh, zuen galderak, ba, ez da baidatzen, eh, hemen gaur izan ditugun izkariekin batera, si os parece, vamos a pasar, como ya ha dicho Nekane, a debatir eh, y a responder a las preguntas eh, que habéis tenido ocasión de, de hacernos llegar y que bueno, pues intentaremos, la verdad es que se ve que hay mucho interés, mucha expectación, muy, muchas ganas de saber eh, qué es lo que opinan eh, bueno, pues nuestras eh, experimentadas y, y sabias invitadas sobre bueno, muchos, muchos temas de la actualidad y del futuro de la moda. ¿no? Eh, apparently the many uh, young designers and aspiring uh, fashion designers among an audience and so um, it's a recurrent theme uh, uh, a certain um, concern about um, a strong educational institution and whether this is uh, essential for the development of talent and uh, the development of a vibrant fashion scene. Do you, from your experience, uh, think that this, again, a, a very strong educational, fashion educational institution is essential for this? I think it's very important. It's very important to acquire the knowledge and to have the community of other students, even more than your professors, the other students that you can work with. It's obviously not 100% essential. People can learn themselves. There have been some extraordinary designers who've been, in effect, self-taught. Um, but I would say that if you didn't have access to a good school, it would behoove you to try and find as many substitute school-like experiences as you can, whether in terms of volunteering or interning with a designer, a kind of quasi-apprenticeship system, trying to see if you could sign up for master classes, and a lot of things you can actually find out on the internet. There are various kinds of massive open line courses which will give you information. So that's another way that you could be acquiring specific pieces of knowledge. But for example, if you really don't know how to do um, pattern making, if you really don't know how to do draping, these are things that are going to prevent you from being as good as you can be as a designer. So you need to acquire as much hard knowledge as you can. Please mention another question raised uh, for you, actually, since you mentioned also technologies and fashion. And this person asks, is the future of fashion 3D technology, or rather a return to artisanal manufacture? I think it's probably going to be a combination of technology and artisanal craft work. Um, technology is going to provide you with new ways to design. Just as I mentioned with the Guggenheim, it couldn't have been designed without these new computer programs. On the other hand, as the audience for fashion becomes more sophisticated and as they're dissatisfied with the fast fashion, what they increasingly want are not only the personal voice of the designer, but also the hand craftsmanship of the creator. And I think that that's becoming more and more important. We need to encourage the, the hand skills, the specialized hand skills that are important for fashion. And we also, I think, need to make our partners in other countries not just exploited laborers, but true partners for that. You don't have to go to Lesage to get embroidery. There's incredible embroidery done in Gujarat in India. But so far, most of those embroiders are being treated like semi-slave labor. They should instead be brought in as full-fledged partners with the designers so that you can work in long-term uh, progress together so it's not just a one-off. Yes. When you talk about embroidery, I think that the example of Dries van Lotten is, is a very beautiful one. He, he's well known for his use of, of embroidery and he works with, um, uh, he collaborates already for years with uh, Indian companies and he employs um, um, uh, on a structural basis about 3,000 people in India that do his embroidery. But he says, I, I also feel responsible for these families and people, so he ensures that in each collection there's enough embroidery 
to guarantee employment for these people. And I think that's quite a beautiful yeah. story. And they really sort of build up a career together. So he challenged them to, to try out, to experiment, to try out uh, different things. And, and it, it, I think that's a very beautiful yeah. example of, of partnering with um, um, uh, craftsmanship yeah. and, 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 and craftsmen um, outside of, of Europe. Uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. There's also this question, I think, coming from possibly a young designer who feels who identifies himself or herself with conceptual fashion, and is referring to something you mentioned in your presentation about the difficulty on the part of the creative community to keep governments involved in their activities, and um, he's asking very specific, or she is asking very specific questions about conceptual fashion designers. Uh, like Margiela or Kawakubo. For example, are conceptual designers such as Kawakubo or Margiela merely an inspiration for more mainstream designers that are the ones who get the money from the big investors? He's saying, is conceptual design given the recognition of important contribution they make to not only fashion but political issues? <laughs> But I think it, it's it's not because it's it's um, conceptual fashion that is just a showcase. It's ready to wear. I think it's very important to stress that in the case of of the Belgian designers, what you see on the catwalk is what you see in the stores. That it's not just uh, a conceptual presentation, a kind of showpiece. It's actually fashion that has been produced and that is sold and worn by people. And um, um, I think often for for audiences, it's it's hard. To um, I often get the question, yeah, but who wears these garments? Yes, there are audience, audiences around the world that, that wear these, these garments, often not as a total look um, um, how, how design is presented during a catwalk show. It's all about sort of uh, 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 styling it yourself. You can wear a jacket, a Margiela jacket with a, a less um, a, a extreme design um, but this is, I think, it's very important to stress that it's it's um, ready to wear and that it's sold and worn by by people. And I would say I would add mm. to that that conceptual fashion is never going to be worn by everybody. Mm. It's all, and the more adventurous it is, the more it's going to be a niche market. You know, whether it's Margiela or Alexander McQueen mm. or Gareth Pugh, the most mm. extreme fashion will always only find a small number of people. I remember I bought a Margiela skirt, which was from a collection that was supposed to uh, imply you had just gotten out of bed. And so it was kind of hooked up as though it had accidentally gotten caught in your underpants. And every time I wore that, I could walk three feet and someone would run up and go, Miss, miss your skirt. And I'd go, thank you, it, it's supposed to look like that, it's Margiela. And I'd go a few more feet and someone else would go, Miss, miss your skirt. <laughs> <laughs> but that was a beautiful collection. That was a beautiful <laughs> collection. But it was a hard skirt to wear. You had to be prepared to deal with that. <laughs> with the reaction. <laughs> I, th I think there's an interesting comparison here, particularly that sort of attention grabbing through the conceptual designs by designers and the way I was talking about attention grabbing by the cities and doing showcasing with very avant garde mm -hmm. designers. Mm -hmm. So I think it's an you know, yeah. interesting comparison. There's also some questions about um, sustainability mm -hmm. in fashion. Someone from the audience is referring to a very specific article in the, which was partly published in the Business of Fashion by Andrea Walker, which talks about uh, the fashion bubble as a metaphor, and um, which raises questions on the sustainability issue of the current fashion system. And the, the questions he, it's bringing is, are the... Are there so many clients for so many brands and so many clothes? Is it sustainable to promote so many designers and so many fashion weeks? What happens to the clothes that are not being sold? Those are important, valid questions. There's obviously overproduction. Fast fashion produces so many clothes that a lot of them are just sort of dumped in landfills. You can't even donate them to impoverished nations. They've already got more than enough sort of bales of old clothes being sent to them. There's also issues of the production that damages the environment and the maltreatment of workers and cruelty to animals. There are a huge number of issues um, that are crucial to how sustainable and ethical fashion could be. And I think one of the first things that the consumer needs 
is a way to find out uh, through the labeling mm -hmm. under what conditions the clothes yeah. were made. Apart from the fact that if you realize you're paying five euros for the blouse, it was probably made by someone who was seriously underpaid. Well, yeah, I, I would like to add that I think it's, it's today very hard for uh, a consumer to, to value garments. Because how, how do you explain to, to a consumer that uh, a pair of trousers of a fashion designer um, costs about, let's say, 400, 500 euros, mm -hmm. and that you, you know, in H&M or Zara, find a similar trouser or jacket for 30 or 40 or 50 euros. And it's very hard to, to um, communicate the, the expense or, or the, the, the immense creative process that designers invest in. And I think today are very confusing times for consumers. Mm -hmm. and, and when Jen talked about um, um, fashion tourism, about the outlet villages and sample sales, mm -hmm. I think the, these kind of um, um, uh, initiatives add to the confusion. And I think in Antwerp we, we had a lot of discussions about all the sample sales mm -hmm. and the, uh, the, the outlet um, stores. And I was asked to, to promote these sample sales weeks in the, in the museum. And I said, I, I don't want to promote it as a museum. And I don't want to um, um, uh, distribute the, the, the leaflets because it's, it's not up to me to sort of um, promote these kind of initiatives because they, they put the, the existing retail under pressure. And it's not that it, it, it is there and it will probably stay there. And we will have to find a way um, to deal with it. Um, and it, it, it has to um, um, be there um, besides the actual retail, but not take over the, yeah. the, the retail. But it's a very difficult exercise, I think. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Was part of the question about the sustainability of all the fashion weeks and the number of de young designers going through as well? Yeah. Um, and I'm not sure how sustainable that is. So, yeah, as a young designer, if any of you are invited to, to showcase that a fa another overseas fashion week, I would really look at the sort of support that you're going to need when you do it. Because if, if you're there on this launch pad with nobody to help you, a business mentor to help yeah. you to understand your business model and to actually help you to make some sales whilst you're there, I think that's very yeah. important yeah. to just be landed in another country. Um, with, with none of that infrastructure and advice around you. Um, I don't think that it's sustainable to for Fashion Weeks to continue to do that. Yeah, I think they have a responsibility. Yeah. The Fashion Weeks definitely should be more yeah. responsible. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Many of the Fashion mm. Weeks just don't attract the, the buyers. No. Right. Mm -hmm. It's just no. like sort of marketing mm. tool, mm. But, but the buyers are already so sort of over... Um, um, yeah, the, the, the schedule is too busy. Mm. That's also why... The, there's no point in organizing yeah. a fashion week yeah. in, in, in Antwerp because you have the same buyers that go to, what is it, first New York, then London, yeah. then yeah. Milan. Paris, yeah, yeah. Then Milan, Milan, Milan yeah. Paris. Yeah. They're exhausted yeah. after a month uh, yes, or longer yeah. of or traveling. If it's, if it's they don't the, want to come to yeah. Antwerp. If it's not those four, it'll be another set, but they yeah. will have their routine yeah. every season. There is the machine that follows them around, yeah. and they won't deviate. Mm -hmm. I, mean, I don't know what's going to happen with, with China emerging, with their fashion weeks. No. Um, it's likely that some buyers may send junior buyers over initially mm -hmm. and sort of test it out. So in a few years' time, we might see some shuffling around, mm -hmm. actually. Mm -hmm. That'll be interesting. Have Antwerp ever been tempted to organize a fashion week? At I, a lot of pol politicians ask me, should mm. we have a fashion week? Yeah. There, a we, there were theme? some experiments mm. with, with um, some trade fairs um, and they all sort of ended sort of in a very negative way because they didn't attract the right mm. buyers. It's all about, again, the networks mm. and having mm. the networks and having the right people for your event, whether it's a trade fair or whether it's a fashion week. Mm. Um, and I think also for, for young designers it's important to know, because a lot of young designers want to be at the Paris Fashion Week, but is that the, the place for your collection, mm -hmm. your work? Are you ready for, for that platform? Maybe it's better to start um, uh, at, 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 a, at a fair or uh, you know, at another mm -hmm. uh, uh, trade event. And it's, it's very important, as, as Jen suggests, to have uh, uh, the right um, uh, consultants um, advising mm -hmm. you. A young designer can easily yeah. be exploited. It yeah. might work yeah. to the benefit of the organizer of the fashion yeah. week, whereas the young designer is hemorrhaging money, gets no mm -hmm. sales at all, and would have done better to yeah. come up with another strategy mm -hmm. to promote her or his yeah. clothes. 
this is actually links to one of the questions uh, that has been raised as well. How can a young designer with a small infrastructure and budget make her or his work visible? This is something that you need to work on from the really from the ground up, that you need to start uh, creating a network. If you're a young designer, do you know, can you meet other young models, young photographers, young computer experts? Can you start putting things <laughs> make a fashion video and put it on YouTube? Can you talk to retailers in your neighborhood to try and find a way you could have maybe a little pop-up event or some other way that you could showcase it locally? You need to sort of build incrementally and get people in your area to know you and then your region to know you and then yeah. keep spreading out from there. Yeah. It's Even if you had a wealthy backer, let's say your, your father was just willing to throw money at you, and I've seen this with uh, designers from uh, peripheral areas, and they pay for the kid to show in New York, and they pay for him to show the next season and the next season, but, you know, after a few seasons, the father goes, you know, I'm spending hundreds of thousands of dollars, and you haven't sold anything, and you haven't gotten a single review, enough is enough. Because it takes a long, long time before people will start to notice you. You saw your figure, 277 estimated yeah. shows in New York. Yeah. It's too many for any human being yeah. to see. Yeah. And I think the, the, uh, one of, of the reasons of, of the success of, of the Antwerp 6 was also that when they were studying at the Antwerp Academy, they built up a, a network. Of, of, of peers, of, of students in graphic design, in photography, and there was this kind of healthy competition between these six students. For example, Anne Müller made her boyfriend, Patrick Robin, was a, a photographer. So suddenly she came up with these very professional photographs, and then Dirk Bickenberg said, I also need a photographer. So he went to the photography department and, and found uh, a, a photographer, same for um, Dries van Noten. So it was like, okay, he has professional images and photographs, I need them to. Oh, he has a very beautiful uh, uh, graphic design for his uh, leaflet or, or, or uh, uh, press dossier, then I also need a graphic designer. And um, these, these different um, um, designers, whether it be graphic designers, fashion designers, photographers, they sort of um, encouraged and, and strengthened each other's careers. It, it, they grew together. So you don't, you don't have to, you know, have your boyfriend be a photographer, <laughs> but it's helpful to find yeah. a photographer. It's helpful to find people who will wear your clothes. Even if you say, I can't afford to pay you for this, but can I give you a jacket? Yeah. Is there something I can make for you that we could do a trade? Uh, and then if you can find your own Pierre Berger, you know, find somebody who's a businessly intelligent person, yeah. that is a huge advantage for a designer because most designers are artistic, creative people. They're not business people. Many of the most successful designers have early on found that business partner who may be a love partner or not, but a business partner who can help them. Mm -hmm. uh, this is uh, for Kat, mm -hmm. uh, related to Antwerp and Belgian fashion, which is so peculiar, so different about uh, Antwerp fashion that makes it unique and that it makes it a brand in itself? Mm -hmm. Well, it, it's not an easy question to answer because from an artistic point of view, I think um, Antwerp designers are very different. Um, they have very different signature styles. I don't think I can compare Martin Margiela with Walter van Berendonck or even Dirk Bickenberg or Dries van Noten or, or Raf Simons. Um, I think they are, they are well respected uh, not only for their um, artistic uh, signature styles but also for their business models and I think their, their uh, uh, Antwerp fashion is, is quite specific. Uh, most of, of the Antwerp designers are still independent which gives them a lot of independent independency and artistic um, um, freedom. Um, uh, so to, I think that's, that's very important and I think in the 90s, which was the era of all the, 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 the big luxury groups like LVMH, it was very tempting for some designers to, to sell their businesses to the big um, luxury groups, but they, they uh, very clearly uh, opted to, to focus on the collections on the clothing and not on the, the um, sales of accessories or handbags or perfumes. And uh, I think with Antwerp designers it's still very much about the clothing, about the collections. And I think that makes them 
quite unique. If you compare Antwerp with London, you know, London's very famous, and it's got London Fashion Week, etc. But if you look at the, the designers who are in London, they're similar to the Antwerp designs. Investors are coming in now and starting to, to take stakes in quite a few of the emerging designers, but there's still an awful lot of them that are hanging on and, and wanting to retain full ownership of their businesses um, and, and being very successful. But they do, you do, as a startup, you do need to really prepare um, the finance, understanding the finances and yeah. the business model. And um, in my work, I see so many young designers who are completely underprepared. Absolutely. Uh, they don't understand about the cash flow of the business, that money's only going to come in yeah. twice a year. Your bank's not going to understand that. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I think and, and preparation yeah. is needed. And that's today is very different mm. than 30 years ago when the Antwerp 6 started. They graduated uh, beginning of the 80s and they broke through in Paris in, uh, 90, uh, in London in 1986. So they had six years in order mm. to learn. They already started commercial collections. Mm. Uh, they, they started with their own collections and then they went to London. Mm. So they, they had six times to learn and also to make mistakes. Mm -hmm. The second generation in Antwerp immediately went to Paris and had a professional mm -hmm. fashion show. I think Veronique Branchino was, was 23 when mm -hmm. she was invited by Anna Wintour in New York and she was mm -hmm. you know, giving interviews for Vogue. She was way too young to, to start. She had no, no business mm -hmm. experience. And after 10 years, she came into trouble. She suddenly had a company of 10, 15 people working for mm -hmm. her, not understanding the... the, the, the the, how, how fragile a fashion business can be and when 9-11 uh, happened in New York she never recovered uh, the loss of her uh, American clients mm -hmm. that suddenly sort of not uh, focused on mm -hmm. the, the home market uh, uh, in, in the States. Um, so it, it's very complex and I think mm -hmm. having a good business partner is mm -hmm. crucial. Absolutely crucial. But I think, as Kat said, you know, if you can actually get some experience with other with other companies, yep. that is so beneficial. And you know, don't don't be frightened of making a few mistakes along yep. the way. We we're so uh, risk adverse in Europe. We don't like to admit that we make mistakes. And in America, it's a different attitude, I believe. Mm. I, I was told by a consultant recently that, that Seven Up, the, the lemonade brand, um, it's called Seven Up because it went through seven different business failures before it got <laughs> to the seventh yeah. one. <laughs> <laughs> um, and we don't want that to happen to fashion designers. We don't want you to fail, but it's you know you, you actually need to, to get some experience and yeah you know, and see what goes on in in businesses and what what works and what fails. Learn from that before you set up your own businesses. Mm -hmm. Actually, this is a rather mm -hmm. straightforward uh, question mm -hmm. for you, John. Do you think, from your experience, uh, Bilbao, without a fashion week, without a festival, without a school, without any fashion museum, could have any chance of successfully promoting fashion tourism? <laughs> you can't. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yes, yeah. I, th I think you need a mix of it. I, we, we, we had a fantastic day yesterday. We, and we, we were taken on a tour of the Guggenheim and we, had, we met the mayor and had a fabulous lunch. And, and, um, what I saw in the city, it's, it's, it's beautiful here, it's exquisite, it's, it's refined. Um, but a lot of the people I saw had come in on a cruise liner and they were walking around um, with their tour guides. And those were the people I was seeing in the city. I wasn't seeing you and it would be lovely to see all of you yesterday walking around. So it was, it, was a, a, it was not the creative city population. So I think you need to have a mix. So you don't necessarily need the fashion festival or the fashion week. But fashion, fashion things going on all the time, you know, fashion happenings, the fashion students and the businesses. And it doesn't need to be a, a huge number because it will permeate it out into, into other, um, other individuals and freelancers in the supply chain, um, the networks, um, the graphic designers will come, the photographers will come. And, and that's, you know, it's, it's creative people, it's not just the fashion people. Mm -hmm. Let's hope then. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> yes. <laughs> well, this is... Um, for Barry and Cut, as directors of two of the most interesting fashion museums in the world. Can you tell us about your relationship from the museum with fashion designers and the fashion scenes of both Antwerp and New York? Is it an enriching, is it, is it an interesting relationship, a fruitful relationship? Mm. Well, I think a, a fashion museum is like a shark. It has to keep moving to live. <laughs> and so it's not enough for us to collect fashions from the past. And we have 50,000 garments and accessories from the 18th century to the present. 
but we're really very strongly committed to collecting contemporary fashion. And that's like collecting contemporary art. You don't have a guarantee. If you see a Chanel dress yeah. from the 1920s, or you see a Balenciaga from the 1950s, you can pretty much say, okay, I, I would like that. But with, I think you're training your eye, you're going to as many fashion shows as you can, and looking for people who seem to be doing something which is personal and special. And then we do try and collect their clothes. Um, if they're already a successful fashion company, we ask them to give it to us. If they're young up and comer, we ask, can they sell it to us at you know a wholesale price so that they're not losing money on having it be in the museum? And we try and emphasize that unlike many fashion collections, ours will be shown to the public quite soon. We have a very active exhibition schedule. So we try and work out a number of related projects. So if a designer's work enters into the collection and we're featuring it right away in an exhibition, we'll try and see if we can get the designer to come and talk at our fashion culture program uh, and have other ancillary events so that they're benefiting from it. Not just We're not just taking from them with their clothes, but also showing them that we're another venue that people can use to see their clothes. Not just seeing it in a store or on the internet, but seeing, looking at it in the context of other clothes within a museum. I think in, in Antwerp we, we very consciously um, uh, decided to collaborate in an intense way with, with designers. And there are museums, for example, the, the Metropolitan Museum that doesn't do shows on living designers. They really uh, opt for sort of the, the more historical um, approach, whereas we invite the designers to often co-curate um, um, shows with us. And, and it's a very difficult um, um, exercise. Uh, what's the, the the task of the museum and what's the task of, of the designer? And but for me, that's 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 always a very interesting um, exercise. Sometimes it works, sometimes you fail. Um, I also think that it's the, the uh, task of a museum to to combine the rhythm of of the fashion world, which is a very fast rhythm. Every season, designers come up with new collections, new ideas, and there's the rhythm of the museum which is much, much slower. And I think uh, people also need the time to, to take a step back and to, to research, to reflect, to analyze um, um, fashion to, and objects. And to combine these two rhythms is, I think, one of the hardest mm -hmm. things to do. To, to have the dynamics of fashion, but also have the, the time and, and time for reflection uh, of the museum. And just like a fashion designer needs to look at her or his clients, we have to look at our audiences. Yeah. Our mission is to advance knowledge of fashion. And we have an audience which, some of it's very knowledgeable as fashion students, it's fashion designers, but some of it's just members of the public, um, anyone from a little kid to a grandmother who lives nearby. So we have to do shows that can be accessible to fashion beginners but can also be interesting and educational and inspiring for fashion professionals. And that, of course, is very gratifying when you have a fashion designer who comes in and says, you know, I was so inspired by that show mm. of yours. That's a, a really important validation. Mm. Do you actually have designers looking into your collection? Oh, yes, they can also make research appointments. Mm. Mm. Have do, you, do you have any examples? Sorry. Do you have any example of a particular... A uh, collection of a particular designer which have which has been maybe influenced by a oh, specific uh, by a specific show. Um, well, I know Anna Sui said to me how she was inspired by uh, the Bonnie Cashin show, and before we had people like Azadine Alaya came and looked in our archive and looked at things like 19th century riding habits, and then uh, afterwards, as a present, sent us things suits which to me looked as though he'd been looking at 19th century riding mm -hmm. habits. So it was nice to, to have that kind of realization that you're inspiring people by showing them things as well. And I've had the girls at Rodarte came in and started crying when they saw the Charles James clothes mm -hmm. in our archive. They were so overcome by how beautiful and important the clothes were.
I think there's a slightly other, another relationship as well going on here between designers and museums. Well, several. I, I work with a lot of fashion designers um, and they are so excited when they're asked to, to donate actually to, to museums and they can't think of anything better than to have the pieces from their collections looked after properly rather than just between layers of tissue paper in their mums and dads' attics. Mm -hmm. um, but they also, in, in London, a huge number of them are invited to the openings of the, mm -hmm. the, ex the exhibitions, right. even if they haven't got works in there. Mm -hmm. And it's part of, sort of the brand yeah. visibility for the young designers, and it's building their networks. Yeah. Um, this is specifically for you, Valerie. Mm -hmm. Someone asked, wanted to ask you if you think designers should think global or rather explore their own local traditions and, and culture in I, their work? I think that that's a very individual mm -hmm. choice. I think that you can certainly, if you're inspired by local traditions and, and craft techniques, by all means, try and integrate that into your work. But if you're not, you shouldn't be forcing that. Mm -hmm. And I think the, the real problem for designers is to try and avoid self-exoticization, so you're, you're just dealing in stereotypes about mm. your region. Um, that can appeal in the short term to foreign buyers, because if they can more easily brand you and say, oh yes, you're doing a flamenco-like dress, you're a Spanish designer, I can recognize that. But in the long run, it, I think the Japanese were so important because what they gave had nothing to do with old stereotypes about cherry blossoms and geisha. It did draw on Japanese aesthetics, uh, but in a way which was very sophisticated and not obvious at all. Um, this is very specific concern about, you were mentioned about um, having gettings and some work experience, some experience, and, and um, about specifically experience and education in pattern making. Someone uh, is concerned about how can I develop these skills uh, without the possibility of ex uh, having experience in companies if most of them are uh, producing uh, patterns in companies in Asia, for example. Mm -mm. That's har it's harder to get the kind of skills in pattern making than it used to be because that, that skill's been exported. But I think it's worth an effort to try to try and find an older um, fashion person who can show you or to go online or to try and find out because I think the more ability you have with these sort of basic tools of making the clothing, the more you can innovate. I think if you look at someone like Rick Owens, the fact that he'd worked doing patterns for different companies before he opened his own house made him so much more skilled at being able to manipulate the shape of the clothes in really new ways that then of course everybody else started copying. Mm. So I would just say that just as you know an artist would like to get acquire certain technical skills, a fashion designer too should make every effort to acquire as many of those skills as possible. But I, Plenty of them have no skills in that and just sketch, but then you're relying on other people to have the skills for you and I think you're, you're more limited if you have, don't have those skills. Well, I don't think that you necessarily need to just think about being a fashion designer. If you, if you are interested in pattern making skills, you can earn really, a really good living as a pattern maker. Mm -hmm. um, I mentored yeah. Mary Katransu for the first two and a half years of her business in London. And she studied print at St. St. Martin's didn't study pattern making. Her first collection was all like, like the shape of the dress I've got on today. It was also t-shirt dresses, tunic shapes, very, very simple. And one of the first things she did in her business was employ a pattern maker, a freelance pattern maker. And then he became a full-time member of staff. And that was her first um, company appointment, actually, investing in somebody to, to help with the, the architecture of the, of the print, Some, something to put the print on. It's part of that network building. You can't have all of the skills. And so you find other people who can be partners and work with you on putting the skills together. Very general question for all of us. Um, do you think current fashion reflect current social and economic changes and problems? It's referring specifically to, to the economic crisis that we've been through in the last years. Do you think it's a reflection or rather that designers are 
sort of practicing some sort of escapism. Well, I don't like the word reflection because it comes from a kind of debased Marxist idea that fashion's just this epiphenomenon that's floating on the surface of real things, which is economic and class warfare. It, instead, I think it's a, fashion's not the mirror of history. It's a part of history. And it's not a reflection of society, but it's a part of society, and it can have an impact on society. Um, I think that it's, it's fairly rare for big world historical events like an economic crisis or a war to have a clear and direct unidirectional effect on fashion. Mm -hmm. It has a fragmented and indirect effect on it. For example, if you can't afford to buy a certain kind of clothing, you won't be buying it, or you'll be more hesitant. But the idea that uh, a depression will lead to a particular style in clothing, mm -hmm. that doesn't hold. It really doesn't. Mm -hmm. It doesn't work that way. Designers work, there's their personal, you the designer or you the person who's wearing it. There's also the world historical events, but it's that part in between the world of craft and the world of art. That's what designers are mostly working at. They're looking at what other designers are doing and what was successful last season. And so they're making changes based on that. If they think, you know, last season, for whatever reason, the economy, the weather, only my black clothes sold and none of the pastels did. I'm going to try doing more black this season. It's not a reflection of a bad yeah. economic climate. It's more like they're trying to assess what will sell. What, believe me, if you wanted pink, I'd make pink for you. But pink yeah. didn't sell at all last season. <laughs> Something I'm seeing is that we're getting um, a wider range of product categories and there's more accessories and footwear and jewellery designers out there now because, you know, as, as consumers, as people are wearing clothes and accessories, uh, we're more likely to be buying accessories now because you, you can get more wares per item. I can wear this bangle a lot more times and, and it not get noticed so much as, as my clothes, so I'm going to buy more bangles because I want to rotate them more. Yeah. And there's um, a few questions, actually, from a number of people uh, wanting to know what you think about Spanish fashion, what your thoughts are, if you have heard about uh, new Spanish and talented designers, if you think about Spanish fashion beyond Sarah and Mango, what your thoughts are about Spanish fashion. Well, the Spanish fashion designer that I'm obsessed with is Sibylla. Mm -hmm. And I'm really, really thrilled that she's coming back into business. And I'm going to be trying to meet her when I go to Madrid in a couple of days. I was always really obsessed with her. When I did my book on women of fashion, uh, one of her looks was on the cover of the book. And I've told some people this story, but I was, um, I'd bought some clothes of hers in Madrid years ago, and I was wearing a raincoat of, of hers on the subway in New York in a day when it was a torrential downpour and no one could get any taxis. So even fancy people were in the subway. And a beautiful, elegant European woman looked at me in the subway and said, I like your raincoat. And I said, it's by Sibylla, this really brilliant Spanish designer. I bought it in Madrid. And she kind of smiled and said, I'll tell her that. I'm her sister-in-law. <laughs> and I said, will you tell her to please answer my letter? Because I want her to be, to be in my book. And then the next day she telephoned me and said, oh, I was writing an answer to your questions you'd mail to me. <laughs> We're trying to loan from her for an exhibition, yes. but we, yeah. we don't manage to get in touch with her. So if you meet her in Madrid, yes. tell her. I will tell her to contact you as well. <laughs> And Del Pozo is another one that I've seen a lot of interest in New York at parties. Uh, and that's starting to look really interesting. Um, but I would need to spend a lot more yeah. than a flying visit here to really yeah. start mm -hmm. finding the most interesting mm -hmm. Spanish designers. And I'd need real local guides who could take me around. Mm -hmm. When I did my show, Japan Fashion Now, I made repeated trips to Tokyo and I got local friends and acquaintances and journalists to take me around, to meet designers and talk mm. to them, to go to their ateliers, to go to their boutiques all over Tokyo, often with a translator in tow, so I could really get a sense of which ones I thought was interesting. And I wasn't just going on the basis of who'd been mentioned in Women's Wear Daily. Mm -hmm. I, I've noticed there's a huge pride in, in Spanish fashion. I, I know a Sp Spanish designer, Emilio de, Ma de la Marina, and he's based in London. He's been there 
six or seven years now and whenever he does a catwalk show it's full of the Spanish press they're all coming over for him and um, it's, it's thrilling and everybody comments on it actually so he's got such fantastic mm. champions over here yeah. there's also in line with it's a very specific question about Madrid as a fashion capital as a fashion mm. city do you think uh, if it is is actually recognized as a fashion city internationally Madrid yeah. or no mm. <laughs> is this something lacking I think it's recognized as a fashion city, but it's recognized again as one of many fashion cities which are in competition. And we've seen that cities can rise and fall. I, I think it's seen as a city which certainly has a vibrant artistic life and has a you know, sort of a history, uh, but it's not clear whether that's going to translate into making it a kind of regional hub. I, I keep warning colleagues in different places don't concentrate on wanting to be the sixth fashion capital of the world. It's, it's not really a winning proposition, and your evidence really shows this. Concentrate on trying to make something special about your place so that it will be valued for what's special. And Madrid could certainly do that. And something that's relevant about Madrid is that the, the Fashion Week's actually out of town. It's not in the centre. So, you know, we talked about London Fashion Week. It's, it, it was two kilometres away from the centre of the, the, the shopping, the shopping hotspot. And it's now it's, it's going to be half a kilometre away. Well, and in New York, you know, it's, it's right. In, well, it's, it's all over New York. It's all over. <laughs> mm -hmm. And actually the Mayor's Office in London is saying they want to have a, a cross-London approach to London Fashion Week eventually as well. So maybe that's going to happen in five years' time. But in Madrid, it's way out of town so actually out of the city the city's not it's benefiting in terms of reputation but the, but the people coming to that, tra that trade fair and those shows they're not buzzing around shopping they're not going to be eating in local restaurants during the daytime at least because they're going to be out on site at the trade fair yeah that's crazy it's really yeah, counterintuitive yeah. Yeah. you want them centered next mm -hmm. to shops and restaurants yes yeah I think um, we can wrap up with this if uh, no one has more questions. This is a, a very recurrent uh, theme among the audience. This is a question that has come up uh, a few times, I have to say. And it is about the challenges that face um, small fashion houses and, and young fashion designers, which is mainly to compete with the giants of the industry, like Zara, H&M, etc. So they're asking for your opinion and advice on how do you think we can we can face this reality? How can we compete with them? What can we do? I think key, you have to have a very you have to have a personal voice. Don't try and copy other people because that's what the the big fast fashion houses are doing, and there's no point in your trying to. And try and build up your network, including your client base, so that you have a core group of fans and. The more they're seen wearing the clothes and photographs of your clothes are circulating. And try and get good business advice. Because, you know, I was talking last night with someone who was saying, well, he didn't believe that a truly talented designer would ever fail. And I said, oh my dear, it's like I've seen so many incredibly talented designers who have failed because they haven't managed to get the finances of things together. They've overexpanded when they weren't, didn't have enough money for it. They were wildly undercapitalized, unrealistic. But the, the, so many of the Belgians have been successful because they've maintained control over and an understanding of the finances that are involved. So if you need help, get help. But try and build your business on a firm foundation because you'll need to have a cushion. It's a very volatile business. It'll find your audience yes. that can be a very niche audience but um, try to find out who who is your customer and there are audiences and customers that want to pay for for fashion mm -hmm. that, that don't buy t-shirts for five euros but they, they want to uh, pay for well-crafted design a qualitative design uh, and w with an own personal signature style so I, I think that is important. It's how to do it, I, there's not like a handbook to, to, to explain you, um, but, but you will find your, your audience, your niche audience, and, and build up a business um, starting from there. Um. Okay. It's tough, but you yeah. can do it. It is possible. Yeah. <laughs> 
So I think we can wrap up now. If there's no any thank other questions, you. thank you. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>